Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, this is Matangi Gopalakrishnan. Uh, I'm a faculty at University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, and I'll be moderating today's session. Today's talk is another edition of the KOL Complex Innovative Design Lecture mini-series, and it is my great pleasure to welcome our two speakers today, Dr. Marius Thomas and Dr. Dieter Herring. Dr. Thomas is currently working as a senior principal biostatistician in the Neuroscience Development Unit of Novartis. Since joining Novartis, um, Dr. Marius Thomas has worked on various project areas in the area, in the various projects in the area of multiple sclerosis. He's a trial statistician for the complex innovative NEOS trial in children with multiple sclerosis. Uh, before joining Novartis, he was an early stage researcher in the IDEAS European Union Training Network. IDEAS is improving design, evaluation, and analysis of early drug development studies. Um, and he there he was working on the development of new approaches for subgroup identification in clinical trials, uh, which was uh, in close collaboration with the Novartis Statistical Methodology Group. And Dr. Thomas holds a PhD in statistics from TU Dortmund University. Um, our um, other speaker, Dr. Dieter Herring, he is executive director at, uh, the, of biostatistics at Novartis. So he's the biostatistics group head for neuroinflammation in neuroscience. He joined Novartis in 2008 and has been working in roles of increasing responsibility in neuroscience Novartis on various multiple sclerosis programs, including the Fingolimod, Siponimod, and Kesimta programs. He planned the redesign of the paradigm study which was the first successfully completed randomized control clinical trial in pediatrics uh, uh, in multiple sclerosis, and it led to the approval of Lenya in pediatric um, MS. Currently, Dr. Herring is working on the NEOS trial, a two-year randomized double-blind triple dummy trial comparing Kesimta and Mesent to the active control uh, Fingolimod in a Bayesian non-inferiority design. Prior to joining Novartis, Dr. Tom Haring studied biology and statistics. Uh, Dieter holds an MSc in biology from University of Basel, Switzerland, and a PhD in biology from ETH Zurich, Switzerland, and a master's in statistics from the University of um, Neuchatel, Switzerland. He worked for his postdoc at the School of Mathematical Sciences at the University College Dublin, Ireland. So, uh, quite a remarkable uh, CV. Uh, before I hand it to our speakers, a um, few housekeeping um, requests um, to keep to everybody to stay on mute uh, while the session is on. And we will have the Q&A session towards the end of the presentation. Um, thank you. And to ask a question, you can use the chat window. You can populate the questions on the chat and it'll be answered at the end of the session. And thanks and enjoy the presentation. Um, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Herring, it's all yours now. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, so I'm going to present the NEOS trial, uh, which as was explained, is a Bayesian non inferiority trial in pediatric multiple sclerosis. It has been uh, submitted to and, and developed, co-developed in the FDA's complex innovative trial design uh, process. Marius, yes. Um, the content of our trial uh, or our presentation, uh, there are two parts. Uh, in our first part, we present the NEOS trial um, and go through some of the features of, of this trial. And in the second part, we talk a little bit about our experience in developing um, an innovative trial design and maybe also try to come up with some uh, guiding principles or uh, some some hints that we can provide for others um, um, that may may help to also uh, develop such trials. Next slide, please. This is the background uh, for pediatric MS. So pediatric MS is a rare disease with only three to five percent uh, of the MS cases um, having an onset in childhood or adolescence. And pediatric uh, MS patients that are considered a vulnerable population 
because these patients uh, relapse very frequently, quite frequently. Uh, that means they have neurological symptoms. Um, and these are MS attacks that are um, um, affecting these patients um, by surprise. So um, you cannot see a, a relapse coming. They lose also brain volume uh, from the onset of the disease. So the, uh, there's a loss of neurons. There's a lot of uh, loss of brain tissue from the beginning of the disease. And overall, um, patients with a pediatric onset have a worse long-term prognosis, meaning that they get disabled at younger age compared to adult onset MS patients. Currently, there's a high unmet need in pediatric MS um, because unlike in adult MS, the few approved treatments and few tested treatment in pediatric MS. In adults, we have about 20 different approved uh, therapeutic treatment options. Um, but in pediatric MS, it has been very difficult to conduct trials uh, because uh, patients are rare, but also because of the highly competitive situation. And so it, only one uh, experiment has been conducted that could successfully show superiority uh, of a new drug versus uh, the previous standard of care, which is an interferon. And that was for Chilenia, um, which has been successfully tested in, in the paradigm study. There's some references below. Next slide, please. So to highlight some of these um, statements and facts, uh, want to say the biological processes involved in MS are largely uh, shared across the age span. So pediatric patients, they pretty much have the same um, biological process that, uh, that are ongoing um, as in adult patients. What is different is the frequency of some of these processes and the frequency of some of these events. So especially uh, young patients, they have um, higher uh, relapse frequencies. So they have more frequently uh, neurological symptoms. You can see that in the graph on the left-hand side, especially in the orange or red curve, um, that shows the relapse frequency as a function of the patient's age. And you can see the, uh, to the left of the dashed line, these are the pediatric patients and clearly they have uh, higher relapse uh, frequency compared to adult patients. Um, the other thing is on the right-hand side, and that's more like the um, irreversible change that is ongoing from the beginning. Uh, I mentioned uh, patients lose brain volume, brain tissue from the beginning. You can see that uh, in this plot, again, uh, left of the dashed line, you see that uh, even pediatric patients, they, you expect these children to have uh, brain growth, but actually they already lose brain volume. Yeah, there's a question about whether we share the screen. I can clearly see it. Is there everyone else too, I hope? I can see it too as well. Right, so maybe um, disconnect and rejoin is probably the best uh, option. Okay, uh, to continue to the next slide, please. This slide um, shows the um, challenging situation uh, with many different medications have been developed in here for adults. And so all of these drugs also need to be tested in pediatric patients. And we can see a highly competitive situation uh, of different trials that compete for the same patients. Um, and so it's important that new trials are conducted in a way uh, that is feasible so that they can be completed. And also uh, that the trials are planned in a way that uh, the readout of the trial in the end is meaningful and interpretable. Next slide, please. So this is a high level summary of the entire uh, trial design. We go then uh, through different elements. The NEOS trial is a two year double uh, dummy uh, or the double blind trial. It's triple dummy because it has two active new medications versus one active uh, control. And it's there to establish the efficacy and safety of two new MS treatments. One is Casimta of Atumumab, that's an anti-CD20 uh, medication. And the second one is uh, Mason or Siponimod, that's an S1P modulator. So these are both uh, normalized drugs um, that have been successfully tested in adult patients. And now you want to test them in, in pediatric patients. The primary endpoint is the analyzed relapse rate. That is a standard 
endpoint in MS trials. It just uh, measures how frequently patients um, experience these relapses and the, the associated neurological symptoms. And one innovative element of this trial, it's a non inferiority trial design. So this is Chilenia, I mentioned already, Chilenia has been shown to be uh, uh, more efficacious than interference, which have previously been the standard of care. And actually they reduced, or Chilenia reduced the relapse rate by 82% versus interference. Um, and based on that, instead of showing superiority as an interference or placebo, what we want to do is show um, that the new medications are similarly efficacious to Chilenia um, by a margin not wide to, to ensure that uh, the new medications are definitely better than an interferon compared to historical controls. You can also see that the trial features an interim analysis, and this is planned when all patients have reached at least one year of exposure, and this is for uh, early efficacy stopping, um, that especially uh, plays a role if the uh, historical trial uh, trials uh, the data there is similar to what we collect in the new pediatric trial. Next slide, please. So you see the different elements here. Um, we talk a little bit about this non inferiority part, uh, extrapolation from adult patients. Um, typically, we have already adult data at the time we um, plan a pediatric study. So uh, can we use this information uh, to extrapolate to pediatric patients. Then uh, the Bayesian part and uh, the robust uh, dynamic borrowing that will be presented by Marius. Um, then the simulation study also, uh, Marius will present that and the regulatory interactions we had. And in the end, there will be a part where we try to summarize our experiences and maybe provide some recommendations of how we um, think one should go about when, um, when planning such a trial. Okay, so the non-referority part, please, next slide. This is our motivation for the non-referority trial uh, design. Uh, we have done this first uh, experiment with uh, paradigms, this first trial. And in that trial, we clearly saw that the experience on Chilenia uh, for patients um, was better uh, compared to interferon. So when we look at the frequency of uh, clinical relapse, there was a one-to-one -one randomization with 107 patients on each arm. But in, on interferon, uh, these uh, pediatric patients had 120 um, times. Patients had uh, neurological symptoms while in Chilenia, it was 25 times, so quite a difference. And that also led to uh, feedback from, uh, from the physicians um, uh, after the trial readout. Um, second point is that brain volume loss uh, um, we can see it in this trial. On interferon, there was 0.8% loss of brain volume per year. And on Chilenia was 0.48, uh, so less brain volume loss on Chilenia compared to interferon. We think that's meaningful. And uh, as I said, the feedback from uh, physicians was also in the way that they thought, or at least some of them thought, that um, we should try to avoid in the next trial the use of interferons or, uh, or even placebo. And so that was our motivation. Uh, we try to avoid low efficacy drug in the next pediatric trial and, and think about how, how could we do a meaningful trial um, and, and still um, avoid a low efficacy drug. Next slide, please. So one thing we did within the uh, FDA's um, CID process is a systematic literature review of relapse rates um, in different trials, uh, especially on interferons. And what you can see that there is clearly uh, between trial heterogeneity that may also have to do with some differences in the definitions of relapses and other things. But overall, um, patients on average relapse uh, once every two years or maybe even more than that um, on interferons. Uh, and that's the uh, the summary uh, estimate here. Next slide, please. There's also, a, the, you see the, the reference to the uh, publication, have a publication for that, so that others can also use this information. Um, and so that led to the, the idea that maybe we could do a non inferiority trial because Chilenia is really quite different in terms of relapse rates to the interferon based on the data that we have, both from adults as well as from uh, pediatric patients and the relapse rates seem to be much lower. So if you could show that um, with the new medication, relapse rates are similarly low as on Chilenia, 
um, by a margin not more than to to allow uh, for a superiority vessel interferon, that could be a possible trial design to actually um, not use a low efficacy treatment. Um, so the idea is here to <clears throat> show that or demonstrate that the new medications are similarly efficacious to Chilenia. Um, and in this case, a margin of two, for instance, uh, would clearly suggest that relapse rates are lower than on interferon. Next slide, please. And we look at the extrapolation from adults because typically when we start a pediatric um, study, we already have data from um, a completed phase three program in adult patients. And um, in the case of MS, that's clearly uh, informative. Next slide, please. So I go now back to uh, year 2010. So that's way before we did the first pediatric study. This is a study in adult patients uh, with MS comparing interferon and, uh, and Chilenia. So interferon uh, beta 1A um, is one treatment and in green it's Chilenia um, FDY 720. And you can see the results here. Um, is evaluated at uh, the time uh, at uh, young patients. So basically, there's a there's a model behind this with a, an age times uh, treatment interaction, and uh, the evaluation is at uh, age 15, which is um, an average age in uh, pediatric MS. And we can see the estimates of the relapse uh, rates are 0.67 and uh, 0.18, so meaning uh, roughly. One relapse every uh, other year on interferon and every eight years on uh, Chilenia. Now, on the next slide, please. If you can see uh, seven years later the actual results from a trial that compared interferon as a Chilenia in pediatric MS patients. And you can see that the estimates are extremely close um, to, what we, uh, the, to what we had anticipated before. Um, Important is also what's on the top of the, the slide here. Um, the pediatric population, these patients are typically um, teenagers. Uh, um, most of them are around the age of 15, as I said, and uh, they go up to the age of uh, 17, while in the adult um, phase three programs, we have patients down to the age of 18. So the age discrepancy is not that huge. And, and so there's clearly a relatedness here. Um, and, uh, and we can see that in this in this first example, which, as I mentioned, was um, was already produced before actually the readout of the paradigms trial and then the paradigms trial was very close to it. So based on that, we thought um, extrapolation from adults to pediatric patients can can be done. And we also looked at the generalizability of this uh, using different uh, trials. So what you can see in this plot or these plots. Um, each panel represents a trial in, in adult MS patients, so freedoms, freedoms to transforms, and so on, uh, with different controls. So for instance, in, in pink is placebo arm. We can clearly see the uh, relationship to age with young patients relapsing more frequently than older patients. We see the same trend in the transforms trial in this brownish color um, for interference. So young patients uh, have the most uh, relapse more frequently than, than older patients. Um, we also see that on highly efficacious treatments, like for instance, Chilenia or uh, of a tumor map, relapse rates are generally very, very low. And now when we, when we compare this to where we actually do have um, uh, pediatric data, then these fall very close to these extrapolations from the adult phase three programs. We have... Um, data from the paradigm study and, uh, and these are, are close to the, these predictions. So, so we think it's possible to extrapolate uh, from, pediatric, uh, from, from adult patients to pediatric patients and then use this informa information in the planning phase of a new trial or even uh, by borrowing some of this information as we will see. Next slide, please. So now the question is, how can we incorporate this historical data? We could use it just um, uh, for planning purposes and maybe in the sample size calculation, but maybe we could also uh, uh, borrowing, borrow it more directly in innovation design. Um, and this is now my colleagues' uh, 
part of the presentation. Uh, Marius, please. Yeah, thank you, Dieter. Um, so yeah, after Dieter has now um, nicely explained why we can um, leverage this data that we have in, in adult studies, um, let's now discuss how we, how we incorporate this data in a Bayesian design in the newer study. Um, so summarizing the data that, that we have consists of relapse data that is available from, from four historical studies for compared to Gilenia, of those are three in adults and one is in children, and then two adult studies for Kisimta and two adult studies for, for Mason, the, um, the investigational drugs. And for each of those studies, we have um, an, an, a log AR estimate and a standard error for this estimate, and this is potentially based on an extrapolation model for the adult studies. And then we use a, the meta-analytic predictive approach to prospectively define priors for the um, AR, so the analyzed relapse rates, the number of, of relapses per year um, that we expect to see in the new study. Uh, and thus our primary analysis model in the end is a Bayesian negative binomial model, which is the, the typical model used for these kind of endpoints um, with informative priors um, for the AARs of the three treatments. And the meta-analytic predictive approach that is used here um, I think it's now quite quite a common uh, commonly used approach for such um, such situations. But the idea is that um, you link the, the source data that, that are available from the different historical studies in, in a Bayesian meta-analysis model, um, where you assume that the parameters from the individual studies are exchangeable so that they come from the same distribution. Um, and you allow for some between trial variability as well. And then we can, if we have a new study, like in our case, the new pediatric study, um, we can simply draw from that same distribution um, to, to um, obtain a, a predictive prior for the, um, in our case, for the analyzed relapse rate in, in the new study. So by um, linking all these um, uh, different uh, studies together in one hierarchical model, we can then combine the information that we have from the historical data and um, make a prediction basically of what we expect to see um, in a new study. Now, one potential issue here and with, with generally with patient designs is that um, the, the potential issue of a prior data conflict. Um, and as I said before on the previous slide, we assume exchangeability between the uh, old studies and the new study. And especially here in our situation where we use um, historical data from adults, which um, as Dita discussed, um, we've seen in the past, we can, at least for Gilenia, very accurately predict what happen what's happening uh, in the pediatric patients. And also, we see that uh, the S relations give us quite consistent results. However, obviously, we, we don't have pediatric data yet for investigational drugs for Kisimta and Mazent. And therefore, we might want to, um, yeah, plan for the possibility that the exchangeability assumption that is underlying our MAP models does not hold and there might be a prior data conflict occurring. Um, we have a situation such as the one shown here where um, you have your informative map prior, which summarizes the information from the historical studies. Uh, you have your, your likelihood data, summarizing the data from the new study, and they are um, not really overlapping. And then your posterior falls somewhere between the prior and the likelihood. Um, so it's neither re representing well what's happening in the historical data nor um, this, the data from the new pediatric study. And that's obviously a situation where um, you can end up um, having a lot of erroneous conclusions, um, increased type 1 rates, type 2, type 2 error rates also potentially. So um, we should try to avoid this. And um, yeah, um, Heinz Schmidtli and, and a few other colleagues proposed this um, robust map approach where the idea is that we can um, relax the exchangeability assumption that is underlying the, the map approach by adding uh, or by creating a robust mixture prior um, where we add the vague weekly informative component to the map mixture so that um, a robust prior consists of a mixture of the informative map part and um, the, a vague prior um, where the mixture weights can be chosen or can, can be understood to reflect essentially how um, skeptical we are about the relevance of the source data. Um, and with this mixture prior, um, the prior becomes much more heavy tailed and also it becomes dynamic. Um, so we, we can, uh, depending on where, um, where the data of the new study will, will end up, we will dynamically borrow more or less from the historical data. Um, and if we're like very far from the historical data, then the informative part of the prior can essentially be 
uh, completely discarded and is not used at all in the, um, in the analysis. And here in, in our case, um, where for Gelenia for the comparator, um, we have previous data from adults and pediatric patients, and we've seen that the extrapolation is very accurate. Uh, we choose a low weight of 0.2 for the weight component, and for Kisimta and Mason, um, a higher weight is chosen for, for our design, where because we only have data so far from um, adults available. And then with this, um, with this robust heavy tail prior, and in such a situation as what we've seen before, um, it, it, it could end up looking more like this, where um, if the likelihood and, and the prior or the informative part of the prior is, is not um, close together or is not overlapping, then our posterior will end up um, close to the, to the likelihood, so close to the um, data from the new study, essentially. And the informative part of the prior is, is mostly um, discarded. So that's the idea of this um, robust map approach, this dynamic borrowing approach that is used here um, in this study. So then I, I would like to discuss a bit the, the simulation studies that, that were performed for um, this trial to understand the operating characteristics and also as part of the um, different regulatory interactions we've had. Um, so generally with, with complex innovative designs, it's of course, of, of course often the case that there are simulations necessary to understand the behavior of the design um, under different assumptions or to compare um, alternative design options. Um, and um, in our case here, we simulation studies were also used extensively during planning of the design, during health authority discussions um, for different purposes to investigate um, frequent operating characteristics, such as type 1 rates, power, um, bias, and root mean squared error of treatment effect estimates um, to determine um, required sample size for, um, for the design under, under different scenarios. Um, to look, for example, what is the impact of, of the intramalysis on type 1 array power? Um, what happens if we modify the design? What, like if we use, uh, if we time, if the, have a different timing of the intramalysis, different study durations, what happens if we have additional success criteria? Um, and the last point you mentioned, impact of double use of historical information for, um, for the non-inferiority margin and the Bayesian priors, which was a, a concern raised by, by FDA during the CID discussions that um, in our study here, we, we're essentially using the historical information twice because first we were using it to inform what would be a good uh, non-inferiority margin, then some of the information is used again in the price, so that was a potential concern uh, from FDA that this would lead to essentially some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where you always conclude non-inferiority, and there were also some simulations performed here by us to show that this is not generally the case. Um, and, and the final simulation report um, for the study um, that was also submitted with the final protocol then, then focused on the operating characteristics of the final design for, for all the um, primary and sensitivity analysis. In this case, the sensitivity analysis primarily look at um, using different weights uh, for the mixture prior, uh, so different weights of the historical information to see, to essentially have a tipping point analysis where you see, okay, how much historical information do I need to come to the same conclusion? And that is one comprehensive document that includes um, simulation results for the final design under a wide range of scenarios. Um, so this is all documented there. Um, and uh, the necessary details are provided um, and the operating characteristics are discussed for these key scenarios. And the report and the codes um, for these simulations were shared with FDA with the final protocol submission. Um, and I just want to show some of the, the um, results out of this final report here. So they focus on the primary endpoint, the analyzed relapse rate. And the scenarios that investigated there primarily looked at different um, relapse rates on, on Gelenia, on the control, and on the, on the two test treatments. So based on the ARR ratio that, that could be expected of the two test treatments versus Gelenia. Um, so the, the, the range of ARRs for Gelenia was based on, on the historical information, so uh, different quantiles of, of the MAPRI distribution were um, simulated. And then um, we looked at different ARR ratios of the test treatments. So either 0 0.8 that the two test treatments um, slightly better than Gelenia, one that they're exactly the same, or, or two where we're right on the edge of the null, null hypothesis, essentially, where um, with our non-inferiority margin two, we would um, not be non-inferior anymore to Gelenia. And in total, those were 25 different combinations that were investigated in these simulations. Um, 10, 10 null scenarios and 15 
um, under the alternative essentially, and, and all simulations were performed using these different prior ways that were used for the primarily analysis, but then also for the different sensitivity analysis. And the simulations also uh, included simulating baseline covariates and adjustment of baseline covariates in these models um, based on um, requests from FDA. Um, and some other simulations that were initially conducted um, that looked also at other parameters or the impact of other parameters, for example, dispersion or recruitment rate, um, they were not part of this uh, final simulation report as, as um, from the initial simulations, we saw that they had um, fairly limited impact or we had like a good idea like of, of what well as we couldn't expect there. So they were kept fixed for the main um, simulation report. Okay. So, so the, the previous slide is telling the first part that has this gold or blue key, and then. Sorry, I had some some background noise there. I don't know if that was a question or. No, I think it was um, a, a speak. I mean, somebody uh, unmuted. So yeah, please go ahead. There was no question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, so now uh, coming to the some of the simulation results. First of all, of course, type one error, error rate, which is always uh, a big potential concern with, with such Bayesian designs that use external information. Um, so what is shown here is one figure out of this report where um, you can see on, on the left part of the graph, this is the type one error rate for the um, Mason comparison versus Chilenia on the right hand part, the right hand side is the um, Gesimta comparison versus Chilenia. And there are the type one error rates for shown for um, different analysis, um, the primary analysis, which uses the most amount of historical information and different sensitivity analysis where um, low weights of the historical information is used. So basically the darker the line here, the color is the more historical information is used. Um, and so, so and on the y axis is essentially here, the, the probability of having a successful trial while, while you're not, um, uh, while well, you're, well, you're actually not non-inferior to Jelenia. So this is this is what is meant here by type 1 error rate. And um, if you look at these results here, what you can see is that compared to the nominal level um, of, of um, 2.5%, the black line here, that on, on the right side of these figures, where you have um, the scenarios with higher um, event rates, with higher relapse rates, you actually have type 1 error rates that um, are below the nominal level. And on the left side on this graph where you have um, generally low um, event rates on all three treatments, this is where you see the type 1 or inflation. Um, so, um, and, and um, here one, one can argue that the scenarios on the, on the right side there is actually much more relevant to control the type 1 or rate because these are scenarios where you have potentially high ARRs on the test treatments that might not be um, where, where one might not be superior anymore to um, an interferon or placebo. Uh, so in these scenarios, you really want to control the type 1 error rate. And on the left-hand side of this figure, um, okay, that we might not be non-inferior to Jelenia, but probably we're still clearly superior to um, interferon or placebo based on the historical data, for example, that Dita has shown um, before. So in these scenarios, the inflation that we see here, um, which can also go over 5% over in some extreme scenarios, um, um, could be considered more acceptable. So essentially with this Bayesian approach, we are kind of shifting um, the type 1 rate from some of these scenarios on the right to the scenarios on the left with, with lower um, event rates. And then also looking at, at the power um, that is again here on the left for the comparison of, of, of um, Mason versus Jelenia and on the right, Kizimta versus Jelenia. Um, obviously uh, for the majority of scenarios, um, you tend to have more power and the more historical information you uh, you use, especially in the main scenarios here, which are in the in the essentially the, in the center of, of these figures here. And, and what is important, of course, is that um, compared to a frequent design, which is actually one of the sensitivity analysis included here, which is the very, very um, light yellow line, um, we obviously see, see quite a significant increase in power. Um, so this is here all in terms of one fixed sample size, but Essentially, also what this means, of course, is that with the Bayesian design, we, we can be adequately powered with a lower sample size. So um, here with the 180 patients that we have for the study, um, we see over 80% power for, for the main scenarios, which, as I said, are the ones in the, in the center of these figures. 
um, and for, for frequentist design where to, to come to the same level, we would need uh, around 270 patients. So uh, there's more than a 30% reduction with, with the Bayesian design, which is very critical here in this, in this rare population. Uh, and to, to kind of conclude here, in terms of the um, details on design, I think this, this um, visualization you show is kind of the, the path to innovation that, uh, that we worked with the study because there's a lot of different elements that kind of are building on top of each other. Um, so moving away from a standard RCT that we might have done in the past with paradigms where we demonstrate superiority versus uh, placebo and inferior active control, um, then moving towards a non-inferiority design where we compare against the highly efficacious control drugs so that we can offer effective therapies to all patients in the study uh, and using this, uh, specifying the non-inferiority margin in such a way that we can, by showing non-inferiority, clearly still demonstrate superiority over interferons or placebo. Um, and then since we're using um, in our study um, treatments where we have um, large phase three trials available, um, and that we know from past experience we can leverage, um, we can extrapolate from, from adult data here to the, to, uh, to the pediatric population. Um, and since we also know that disease bio biology is similar, um, so that we can leverage this information from the adults and reduce the sample size in the pediatric population. And all this data is incorporated using the Bayesian design where we use the, the robust dynamic burrowing approach um, to incorporate all the prior knowledge that we have about the disease um, and the drug. So then um, I also want to go into a bit of the um, health authority interactions we've had for this study. Um, of course, primarily as, as Dieter mentioned, we, this, this part is uh, primarily as part of the FDA CID pilot program, which this study um, was part of, as Dieter mentioned in the beginning, um, but then also on the, on the EU side. Um, so, so this shows the general timeline um, in terms of the interactions for this study. Um, so as you can see, it was um, quite a long process. Um, so it all started uh, around 2017, 2018. Um, back then there were still two um, separate studies planned um, for Kisinta and Mason. And on the Kisinta side, there was the proposal of using the Bayesian on inferiority design, um, which was uh, so very similar to the, to the final design that, that was presented here now. Um, and that was submitted for the FDA complex innovative designs pilot program and was then also accepted there. Um, so in 2019, we had the um, discussions with FDA um, as part of the CID pilot. So um, there we were granted to face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and, and then also based on discussion, it was quite quite clear that for Mason, probably a similar design should be chosen. And actually in, at the end of this discussion, FDA also encouraged to combine, uh, combine the trials, uh, the two separate trials into one trial with a common um, control arm further reduce the number of patients required. Um, throughout 2020, um, after the, the main CID um, program, I mean, the, the two face-to-face two -face meetings of the CID program in 2019, in 2020, we still had some follow-up discussions um, with focus on some of the Bayesian elements, um, which then led to the acceptance of the NEOS design um, in, in the US. And also we had further discussions um, in the EU. As we, we went for the scientific advice uh, and also um, submitted a PIP modification, um, which um, then in the end led to um, acceptance so that in 2021, um, we had the final protocol in the beginning of the year and the study could be initiated in, in October of that year. So the study is currently recruiting and we expect um, a last patient last visit around 2026. So it's still going to be quite a long study, but um, yeah, with, with these uh, reductions that we have achieved through the patient design, um, it's it's much um, more feasible to to complete the study. And and summarizing some of the the feedback um, that that we received, and this is kind of shown here on the on the left hand side in the U.S. with FDA and on the right um, with the EU, because I think one one thing that uh, can often be a challenge, obviously, if you have quite a few non-standard elements as as we do here, is that um, health authorities might have different views on on things, and that's uh, I think that certainly been our experience, especially initially. Um, so what is summarized in this table is some of the um, initial feedback we received from the different elements. Um, on the extrapolation, for example, um, the FDA said there were some concerns about um, these models relying on unverifiable assumptions, um, which is 
of course, true to some extent, although I think we have very clear data that that shows that that what we predict there with the extrapolation models is very accurate and, and very consistent also, which uh, I think um, yeah, increases the confidence in these models. Um, and we further explored there also other possible prognostic factors that might need to be included. Uh, while on EMA, that was not um, such a, a strong focus on, on this topic uh, on EMA side. Um, for the non-inferiority margin, um, we initially proposed a non-inferiority margin of three, which was considered too large by, by FDA. So they um, asked for further discounting mostly um, due to lack of pediatric data available to assess between trial variability and that's primarily pediatric data from, from clinical studies because as Dita mentioned in the beginning, there's only been really one, at the time there was only really one clinical trial that had been completed in pediatric MS. And as a result of that, actually, we conducted this, this literature review or we were asked to conduct this literature review and meta-analysis um, by FDA that, that Dita showed in the in the beginning of the presentation to, to get an understanding of, of all the potentially relevant prior knowledge that, that uh, might need to be incorporated. Um, while there in the EU, actually, we had um, initially um, in, in the PIP for Casinta, the, the margin three, um, accepted also based on the scientific and, and feasibility considerations. Um, in terms of the Bayesian design, I think in, on FDA side, there was from the beginning an openness um, towards the Bayesian approach and that it could be useful. Uh, as I mentioned already a bit earlier, there were some concerns about the double use of historical information. And obviously there were a lot of simulations requested to understand the operating characteristics. Um, uh, on EU, we, had, we did not have, the, we had the, the Bayesian design not part, as part of the initial Casinta PIP. Uh, and during the scientific advice, there were um, there was some concern about the lack of type 1 error control in some scenarios, um, as well as the subjectivity of the weight given to historical information. Um, and in terms of the interim analysis, um, that was on FDA side endorsed um, and without um, a lot of, of discussion uh, on that side, while on, on the EU side, for example, there were um, also for the initial PIP some, some concerns about an inadequate assessment of long-term safety and uh, also from scientific advice, um, there were some concerns about adding another level of complexity to an already complex design. So I think generally this, this shows that, um, yeah, the feedback that, that we got from, from different uh, authorities, um, yeah, was quite different at least initially. So uh, that was obviously also a challenge for us sometimes to, to align like these different um, viewpoints. And, and the key modifications also summarizing those um, that the design went through based on the authority feedback. Um, so one key thing was certainly the non-inferiority margin, which was um, due to the concerns by FDA change to um, two instead of three um, to, to have further discounting essentially um, for potential between dry variability also. Um, and um, additional upper limit of the AR was also included in the success criterion. Um, to have an, session, an additional safeguard um, if, if we would be in a range of, uh, in, the, in, in an area where the relapse rates would be high and potentially we would not be superior anymore to interference. Um, also based on FDA request, there was a key secondary analysis added to compare the test treatments um, directly against historic interferon data instead of the indirect approach to the um, non-inferiority margin that is the primary analysis for the study. Um, so the, the approach there is, is quite similar also to the, or it's also based on the map approach essentially where uh, we, we form a, um, a map distribution based on the historical inf interference studies. Obviously the studies were combined, I've already mentioned that, and also this tipping point analysis um, that was in the end pre-specified to assess the robustness of the conclusions from the Bayesian analysis on the different weights of the brain information um, from the pre-specified weights for the primary analysis to a no boring strategy so frequent design was um, incorporated based or was included based on the, the health authority feedback we received um, to further assess how much um, do the conclusions rely on the historical information. And in the end, then um, with these changes, also this, this final design was um, accepted by, by both FDA and um, in the EU. So then for the, for the last part, um, I would uh, hand back again to Dieter and uh, he will talk a bit about our general experience with CIDs and what um, could be some proposed um, guiding principles. Yes, thanks, Marius. Um, yeah, so you've heard the uh, specifics about the NEOS trial, and now 
um, we're trying to distill some some resource, some some of our learnings into this last part of the presentation to maybe come up with some proposals that may be helpful to um, others who um, also plan to um, plan a new trial, uh, an innovative uh, trial design. Next slide, please. So I think one of the things that, uh, that is remarkable, everyone wants to produce uh, efficacious, safe drugs for, for patients. I think this is something that's uh, common to all stakeholders, but the focus of uh, what people are looking for, especially in innovation, uh, may be different. So from a patient and also from a physician perspective, the focus may be to minimize risk for patients, uh, uh, adverse events, uh, you know, the, the avoid uh, low efficacy drugs, um, also, Drug access may be, um, uh, may be an important uh, focus. When do patients have access and so on? On the sponsor side, uh, clearly uh, one of the focus areas is the efficiency of a trial design, the feasibility. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, of course, uh, we want to minimize erroneous decisions. Um, goes in the direction of type one error and also type two error uh, rates. And I think the type two error rates uh, is something that should also be mentioned here because typically we only have one uh, shot at uh, testing a new drug in, pediatric, in a pediatric population. And if that fails, then probably no one else will, will try to test the same drug again. Um, so uh, if we run an underpowered study or so, uh, that is an issue. There's of course also the, uh, uh, I'm, put it here as caution, no shortcuts. There's the notion that any kind of innovation could be a shortcut uh, because typically an innovation somehow deviates from the standard. And so we need to, to be clear about what is the advantage of that uh, specific uh, deviation and of that specific innovation, why are we doing it? And, and what's the added value compared to uh, the default design? Um, next slide, please. Innovation deviates from the gold standard, at least in one dimension. Um, so this is just to, to say, whatever we do um, that may be considered innovative today is somehow deviating from what is considered the standard, otherwise it's not an innovation. Um, and so one needs to be clear about why are we innovating and what's the advantage of that element. Next, please. Um, so simulations may help uh, in the discussion uh, of, of subjo uh, subjective components. So typically when we have such a deviation, it's not acceptable under all scenarios. It's acceptable in a specific setting of parameters. Uh, for instance, one may need to weigh things that do not have the same currency. For instance, the patient burden versus sample size concentration, feasibility versus, versus the, the burden to patients or so, um, which are difficult to, to understand. So simulations may help to, to see um, how does, does that balance and, and different people may have, different reviewers may have different views, personal views also to some extent, subjective views. So it's, it's important to understand that under all possible scenarios. With the weight given to historical uh, data, it may be another example. So it depends on how relevant one considers the historic uh, data, for instance, and the disease similarity is the uh, concentration, which may not have a, an objective definition necessarily. Or when is type one error uh, inflation acceptable? There's probably no general rule where that would be acceptable in all scenarios. And we will look at the specific scenario that Marius presented again. Next slide, please. Or next. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the important piece here is that different stakeholders uh, in this process of, of developing a trial may try to optimize different elements within the trial. And so understanding that may help to actually align people and, and to, to also uh, see uh, the aspects other, um, other parties are focusing on and, uh, and considering that from the beginning. Um, next. So the acceptability of many of these innovative features are probably only acceptable in a specific clinical context. There is no one size fits all. Uh, as I mentioned, type one error inflation would be acceptable. It, it may only be acceptable in a specific scenario. And that uh, requires even more collaboration between statisticians and clinicians um, in this setting. And that's 
true on the sponsor side, but also that's true uh, on, on the regulator side, I think. Next slide, please. I want to give a specific example for this clinical context and what I mean by this. Uh, we've seen uh, from Marius the um, simulations with type 1 error inflation, and clearly we could see that on the left-hand side uh, in this graph, there is type 1 error inflation. So that means when relapse rates are really, really low, um, you see 0.15 is, is the mark where that starts to be above the uh, nominal mark. That means when patients have a, a relapse of one every six, uh, one relapse every six years, roughly. So when, when relapse are really uh, rare, then uh, it becomes a consideration that maybe we cannot distinguish anymore between the new medications from, uh, from Chilenia, or we may incorrectly conclude that uh, the new medications may be similar to Chilenia. But in that specific context, the next slide please, in that specific context where patients have very, very low relapse rates, we know from the historical context that that has never been seen in a pediatric MS population. So very likely then also the new treatments are efficacious. And so the, the focus is then not so much on how the different medications compare, but all of them are very likely efficacious and, and uh, could potentially be approved if they're also safe. So in this case, type 1 error rate is deemed acceptable in this specific context, because if we have a real uh, very low infrequent relapses, then we know that uh, the drugs are um, very likely to be efficacious versus the historical control. Next. So understanding the operating characteristics is really important. And we can do that before we conduct the study and also after we do the, the study to understand the, uh, should not say, the, so the, part, the first part is about understanding the operating characteristics and the second part is uh, about understanding, for instance, the borrowing or so, so it's uh, insensitivity analysis. So there's an element uh, of what we can do before we uh, initiate the trial, and then there's an element of what we can pre-specify to understand uh, the data when we have the data, uh, when we have the data, yeah, when the study is completed. And tipping point analysis, for instance, with different weights um, of borrowing uh, is a way that we can look from, from frequency approach to a Bayesian design. There should be a pre-planned uh, um, protocol scenario probably, um, but we can also understand how it, the data would look like on the different scenarios uh, so that other reviewers can assess uh, their preferred scenario maybe. Next slide, please. Um, so here on this slide, um, we try to, to come up with some proposing guiding principles. So the first thing is really understand why the innovative trial design is better and in what way and try to articulate um, why, what is better about the innovative trial design compared to the default solution. And if that cannot be spelled out very clearly, then probably uh, it's the best solution to uh, revert back to the default uh, solution. Um, so, so explicitly um, spelling that out is important and um, also simulations may help to articulate that advantage. Uh, the next. Design options are, of course, important that they can be explained uh, from the sponsor side, but also from the regulatory side. Uh, from regulatory side, I think um, that people can um, also then justify why they they allow for a specific um, innovation, or that they can understand uh, that that people can understand why uh, a drug gets approved. Um, so we need to also think from that perspective. Um, the, the, is the design, and um, once the data is available, is the uh, the results are they explainable, and um, and the decisions can they be understood? Next, and so simulations. Uh, the the proposal is to uh, at least look at power type one error bias, and then uh, plan for some tipping point analysis within a trial. Um, and we have the, the common ground in the, in the box on the top, so. So probably the common ground for all these studies are um, uh, everyone wants to um, test the efficacy and the safety of a drug. Um, the, the study should be done as efficiently as possible and with a low burden as possible, while still 
maintaining a scientific rigor uh, so that we can be, bring new tested uh, therapeutic options to, to patients. And so thinking about these things uh, may help to um, uh, be more efficient in bringing new medications uh, to pediatric patients. Thank you very much for listening to us and hope that was uh, helpful and uh, we are here for questions also. Uh, thank you, Dr. Herring and Dr. Thomas um, for a great presentation. So the floor is open to questions. Um, yeah, yeah, you can either use the chat window or unmute yourself to ask the question. Thank you. There is a question on chat. Yeah, this is a this is a hello from Belgium. <clears throat> Did we consider multiplicity since we have two treatment arms, but non-inferiority study considers considers ninety five percent confidence interval. So I wanted to confirm. <clears throat> Sorry. So we have um, we have no specific. Uh, adjustments for the two uh, test drugs. Um, so um, each of them is uh, test of it as if it was an independent trial. Are you saying anything to add? No, I think that summarizes it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another follow-up question regarding the uh, non-inferiority margin. So uh, how did you propose margin equals to two? Ever did you ever consider other margin like two point five or other uh, negotiation with regulatory? Do you want to take um, this or should I? Yeah, I can start. I mean, uh, I think we had it on the slide. Our initial proposal was uh, margin three. So, um, and that was based primarily on on the previous paradigm study. Um, but yeah, it was kind of a process of, of discussion with, with, with FDA and health authorities. So, um, as I, as we had it in the presentation, so FDA did not uh, agree to this initial proposal of three because they considered it too large. Also, given that there was only one previous randomized clinical trial, um, in, in pediatric MS. And I think we had during the discussions, we also proposed, um, margins in between three and two. Um, but uh, I think actually initially I think FDA wanted would would have liked to see even a margin below two, and it's kind of the two is what uh, was was um, then accepted also based on the feasibility concerns in in the rare population. Yeah, there is also the, the guidance right on the uh, non inferiority margin selection. So initially we did it based on the uh, rate ratio between interferon and uh, chilenia. Um, on the only uh, study, randomized control study in pediatric MS. Um, we used that confidence limit, which gave us uh, an nominal margin of 3.3. And so with some discounting, uh, we, we initially uh, proposed three as a, as a margin. That was the, the first proposal. Um, that was before also doing this uh, uh, literature review and so on. Uh, then we looked at uh, the data much more systematically, uh, also in interactions with the with the FDA um, of what would be acceptable. Whereas, of course, the uh, the feasibility uh, considerations of of um, um, how large could the study be and and uh, what would be possible and the clinical context, and so all of these uh, different scenarios. But then also um, some some statistical scenarios with some some formal discounting uh, methods they were compared and discussed and and so um, in each, um, in the end the uh, the decision uh, was based on on a on a compromise of of all these uh, different elements. But clearly. Um, if the, the new study was uh, similar to a new uh, to the, to the existing studies, uh, then that would be um, strongly suggesting superiority versus interferon. Uh, there are quite a few questions on the um, chat window. Uh, perhaps we could go over that. Um, the question is from Carl. Any HA discussions on estimates? Um, I mean, not, not really. Um, we had, I think some, some discussions later on, 
um, where, when uh, we were kind of finalizing the protocol, I think there were some discussions maybe on um, some like COVID and the current events and things like that, but nothing that was really related to kind of the innovative um, aspects here, I would say. I don't, I don't remember any, any uh, questions or discussions on that. Yeah, that's correct. Later on, exactly on these additional aspects, but not for the central uh, elements. Um, the next question from Telba. Since you reduced the non-inferiority margin from three to two, could you maintain the power uh, at 80%? Yeah, yeah so we, 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 mm -hmm. Go yeah, we can still maintain the, the power with, with the margin too. I mean, this is, we had to increase the sample size to, to account for that. Um, yeah. So with our initial proposal, we would have had a smaller sample size. Exactly, we would have initially had a, a small sample size and with the, with the um, sample size of two, the trial is similarly large as the last one that we could uh, complete, but we can now test two new um, test medication versus Gilenia, while the previous one we could only uh, do one. and. Given that the uh, bit of similar sample size it was possible last time, I think the, the anticipation is that it's possible this time, which may not be the case because it's more um, uh, competitive, the environment, I would say. And um, I think just to uh, summarize the, the feasibility last time, we opened um, a lot of centers across the globe uh, um, and, and we recruited on average, I think, one patient per year, a bit less than one patient per year, just to explain how difficult it is to recruit these patients. Um, the next question is, did you retain interim analysis for FDA submission plan? Yes, so the interim analysis is still part of the, the final design. Yeah, the next question is, did you perform formal elicitation for the weight parameters of your mixture priors initially? How was that done? Um, I mean, it was not really formal prior elicitation. Uh, I think uh, we kind of had these initial weights in mind based on, as we mentioned in the presentation, that that for one, for the comparator, we, we do have previous pediatric data, so we have a higher um, confidence there that, that the historical data will be applicable versus the test treatments. But then I think it was coming up with those initial weights and then also looking at the, the operating characteristics uh, and seeing that the, from our perspective that the type 1 rates, for example, are acceptable with, with these weights. So uh, it, it worked more like that rather than having a, a formal elicitation process, I would say. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of, of selecting these weights, just to explain that again if uh, um, the, so we gave more weight to um, the prior information where we actually do have pediatric uh, data which is uh, mainly the case for Chilenia um, and for the um, projects where we only have adult um, patient data uh, we give less weight but how much weight you give is of course as I mentioned a bit uh, a subjective uh, component um, so so we have a, a version of what we think is right in, in the protocol which will be the main analysis but then also we um, have um, other analysis to uh, to vary this so that people can uh, review it as part of the review process of how, how the analysis would look like Um, the next question is about uh, retention rate. Was it used? And if yes, how was that decided? Um, so I assume retention rate means here like uh, patient, like dropout uh, rate in the trial. Um, so if it's that, I mean, that, that was um, also based on, on historical studies, primarily based on the paradigms. Um, paradigm study, we, we looked at the paradigm study, what was the, the dropout rate there, and, and based on that, um, that was also included in the simulations. Um, so, yes. Hi, this is Allah. Um, so, I, actually, I was, uh, my question was about the retention rate of the treatment effect. Usually, it's about 50%, but sometimes the regulatory agencies may ask to increase that retention rate. Have you guys considered? I guess not. <laughs> okay. No, no. I, I think the um, 
uh, the um, treatment effect is, is, is assumed constant for the duration of the trial. So uh, maybe I misunderstand uh, your mm -hmm. question, but I think what you're asking is, is more like for long-term treatment and maintenance of treatment effect and so on. Uh, no, so if you read no. the FDA guidance on non-inferiority trials, um, they have especially, um, it started with the synthesis approach to consider the retention rate of the treatment effect in the non-inferiority trial from the, the, the historical trial, right? So with the non-inferiority trial, we assume that we, um, the new drug is, is non-inferior to the active drug that was shown to be superior on the placebo. So basically it's a retention rate of the treatment effect of the new drug versus placebo, like that. Right. Uh, but yes. yeah, I, I know that's, that's kind of a new concept and I was wondering if any of your regulatory interactions stumbled on that. <laughs> I, I think actually we we yeah we we did have a uh, summary as, as part of the uh, statistical derivations that Marius also explained, um, but it it did you know we had different scenarios of of you know different approaches to the non inferiority margin from from a statistical perspective and also from from the clinical perspective and uh, I think that that was also one of the approaches that was uh, was discussed but in the end the, I think it's not one formal. Um, way that led to the uh, decision of this specific uh, margin that is used. Uh, it's more like, um, as I mentioned, a bit of a compromise between uh, statistical and feasibility considerations. I think that's what, in the end, uh, decided it. Okay. And, and maybe in addition to that, I think also because here we we kind of trying to we look at the historical uh, treatment effect of of Gilenia versus interferon, so it's not. Uh, as a placebo, placebo. Mm -hmm. and you see interferon itself has um, maybe not a huge effect, but has some effect also um, compared to a placebo already. Um, so in that sense, if you if you specify a non-inferiority margin based on historical comparison versus interferon, you would expect to retain some effect with placebo. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Um, the next question is about um, how would you handle interim stopping rule if criterion met for one but not both drugs? Yeah, so in, continue. Yes, yeah, go, exactly. Go ahead, so in, in the case where it's, where it's uh, essentially um, one one drug is clearly working and the other is inconclusive, we would we would continue. Hmm. All right. Um, the other question I'm seeing is, uh, is your final NI margin three? Did the PDCO have a concern about this? Um, no, our final margin is two. So that's what's, uh, what's in the protocol. So I mean, PDCO, uh, I think initially, initially they accepted three. So uh, then obviously with, with two, they were, after the FDA also was, was uh, uh, fine with the margin of two then also I think on the you said that was um, was fine yeah and uh, we, um, but it highlights kind of the um, the difficulty with innovative uh, elements and, and agreements with different regulatory agencies that maybe the um, the different concerns may not be the same exactly uh, and it's difficult to to actually have a solution that's globally acceptable uh, to everyone um, uh, with these non-standard uh, features. Uh, that's our experience. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions on the chat. If there are any remaining questions, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Any questions? Okay, I'm not hearing any. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, Dr. Herring and Thomas um, for, for a great presentation and an engaging question answer session. And thank you all for joining. Um, have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.